Today on episode 820 of CXO Talk, we're answering the question, does generative AI actually make you more productive? Our guests are Karim Lakani, who heads the Digital Data and Design Institute at the Harvard Business School, and Francois Condelon, who is Global Director of the Boston Consulting Group's think tank called the BCG Henderson Institute. Karim, tell us briefly about your work at Harvard Business School. I've been here, gosh, 18 years now at Harvard Business School. Two big roles. One is this new institute that we set up, Digital Data Design Institute, DCubed, because we feel that the power of digital data and design is exponential, not linear. And then also the Laboratory for Innovation Science, which is the place where I do all of my research as well. And Francois, welcome to CXO Talk. I'm, th I'm thrilled that you're joining us today. I've been with BCG for more than 30 years, um, and I have actually two roles today. One, I am, as you said, the uh, Global Director of BCG Anderson Institute, where I focus my own research on the impact of tech in general and AI in particular on business and society. And on the other side, I am a practitioner as I am leading, uh, or uh, let's say, AI transformations for our clients in the tech and telecom sectors globally. So it gives me the opportunity to work with Karim. You both were involved leading this very interesting research study. It's called Navigating the Jagged Technological Frontier. Tell us about your research. Karim, you want to jump in and give us an overview of that work? The whole idea came about when Francois came with his team to my office and we were talking about generative AI and what that was going to do to knowledge workers. And through a series of conversations we were having before and after, we realized that we we're at this very special moment in the history of knowledge work, where all of a sudden this new tool that could generate text, that could be a cognitive aid, was becoming widely available. And uh, many companies were adopting, but nobody was sort of approaching it in a scientific way. So we felt like this was a unique opportunity for us to partner together and do a study, a rigorous scientific study, an experiment, a field experiment, where we would be able to study the implications, the impact of this tool on knowledge workers at BCG. And that's what the study uh, was designed for. We run it as a randomized control trial. There's a control group, which does not use ChatGPT for a couple of tasks. And then a treated group that get, does use ChatGPT. And then we can measure a range of outcomes. And so that was the design of our study. And it was an amazing collaboration. We loved working with Francois and the rest of the uh, BCG team. We pushed and pulled each other quite a bit. Yes, um, a lot. And um, it was quite... Um, quite eye-opening for us to do this study and put it together. Uh, and then the reception since the study has came out in September has been quite, uh, quite, quite amazing as well. Yes, and I believe it was quite amazing because it was one of the rare studies I have seen where you were basically working, it was large scale, more than 750 BCGers with real knowledge workers on working on real tasks. So it was not something where you were just having, uh, let's say, students, and no offense to any student, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the fact that, yes, this is our day-to-day -day job. So uh, that makes it different. Yeah. And, and what is true as well is that what we found is that people were more working on, uh, let's say, um, uh, what the impact of the macroeconomics and the potential of these technologies. And there is little that is said on how to implement it, uh, what, they implement, uh, what is the uh, impact on the relationship or the collaboration between human and, and generative AI. So, so I think this is why it resonated so much. Can you describe the methodology? How do you set up a scientific experiment with consultants and something like ChatGPT in a way that is reliable? One of the things I've been doing at HBS uh, since I started my academic career is to run field experiments, right? So in the, the notion is that when there are policy questions, strategic questions, you can go by intuition or you can run it as a proper A-B test. And so my lab at the Laboratory for Animation Science, we've done a range of experiments on online platforms, in-person meetings at the Harvard Medical School, at the Broad Institute, and so on and so forth. And so we took that apparatus and that experience for about 18 years to be able to run experiments inside of organizations to solve that problem. So 
here's what we did. First, we collaborated with Francois and his team to really understand the, the how and what kind of tasks knowledge workers, so these are individual contributors in the consulting uh, pyramid, do, uh, and then designed two tasks that were uh, that were representative of what the consultants did. And so that those tasks were then standardized. Uh, one task was a creative problem solving, brainstorming, innovation task. And the other one was a business analysis, you know, read customer interviews, look at a spreadsheet and make some decisions and recommendations. So those tasks came about in us really working together to really say, are these really representative of knowledge workers? And we wanted to sort of, in the first hand, make sure that they represented what BCG consultants were doing, but also more generally what we sort of see in the economy with knowledge workers, basically the graduates from the top business schools and where they were going. So that was the first task to do that. The second task was to then pre-test the, these tasks, make sure that people actually can do them and do them in the right amount of time and so on and so forth. And then we were able to, working with Francois, recruit 758 mm -hmm. consultants, non-trivial. The CEO of BCG sent an email, spammed mm -hmm. the entire company, uh, encouraging people to participate. And again, the, the idea was, let's be scientifically rigorous about this. We can all make predictions about this or that, or find a little bit of data here or there. We wanted to make it a scientific study, just like a, like a drug study for an FDA, right? Like you want it to be uh, you know, treatment and control. So the CEO sent the message out. We were able to recruit 758 consultants. We made it in incentive compatible, we mm -hmm. offered incentives for it as well. And then we basically pre-test everybody in all the tasks, and then we randomly assign people either to a control group or uh, to the treatment group where GPT was, was provided. One more thing, again, this is again the cooperation we got with BCG. We got GPT-4 access uh, through APIs. And remember, this is like April, May of 2023 yeah. of last year. Uh, so we, we got through API access. But then we built, the BCG team built a chat interface so that we could capture every single prompt being used as well and track all of that. And so that was a big effort. Last bit was that we had to evaluate all of these submissions that we were getting. Some evaluation was automated, but there's also a lot of human interaction and the evaluation. Mm -hmm. And there again, we was a HBS team and a BCG uh, consultant team that actually went ahead and evaluated all the responses from the 750 consultants. So that was the, 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 the setup. Francois, can you tell us, what did you learn? Can you give us an overview of the results? I mean, 758 consultants, that's an extraordinary number. It is. And, and I would say I have three big let's say, uh, learnings. The first one is that there are tasks where the um, augmented human or human plus AI is actually much better than humans. But there are some others where the augmented human is worse than humans. So, uh, on other, it is not just that it is not creating value, it is destroying value. And what surprised me there is that these consultants who are trained to be strong critical thinkers were basically not able to differentiate whether it was creating or destroying value. So, this is the first key finding. The second one is that when it is within the jagged frontier, uh, when uh, um, AI is adding value and so the augmented human is better, basically it is both a great enhancer, 90% of the uh, consultants, 9-0, were benefiting from it. But it is a great leveler as well, in a sense that uh, you had, uh, you, let's say, the, the ones who benefited most were the ones, the, the, the consultants that were below average in the, uh, in the, in the first half. I thought nobody was below average at BCG. No, you have an average. <laughs> You are above the global average, okay. but then you are <laughs> below course, the yeah, average yeah. of the group. No, I thought, you know, I, by the way, full disclosure, I spent a few years at BCG myself. That's how I got to know. Uh, uh, I had not met Francois before, but uh, but you know, our view was that only the best get into BCG. Sure. Right? <laughs> but there is a distribution. Uh, there is a distribution, <laughs> even in the best. And, and the last thing that is important as well is that there is a kind of a trade-off in terms of creativity, you improve the creativity, the performance of the augmented humans was much better, but however, it is at the expense of the diversity of the ideas of the group. Mm. 
And so there is a kind of a trade-off, and we are currently working with uh, with Karim on trying to see how we can change that. Maybe because very often people talk about we should start with AI and or Gen AI, and we will then get enhanced by humans. But maybe what needs to be done is to start with humans to have the diversity of ideas, and then leverage AI to improve it. And on creativity, maybe one more thing, which is that 70% of the consultants, we interviewed each of them after the, they performed the, um, the, uh, the task, and 70% of them were saying, okay, actually we realize there is a, maybe a risk to have a creativity muscles atrophy. And, and I think that's a very important element for us and for companies as well to try to see, okay, what happens? What are the skills that I need to keep to, uh, and to build and to uh, increase and to, uh, let's say, to uh, leverage to make sure that I have a great source of competitive advantage later on? Am I correct in hearing that this jagged technological frontier that you described indicates that in some cases, generative AI, chat GPT, can significantly enhance productivity. However, when not used correctly, misunderstood, whatever it might be, you can have a significant decrease in productivity. Is that, did I understand that correctly? That's true, but I'm not sure I would use the word productivity, yeah. which is very often uh, related to, okay, I do things faster. Here, it's more a question of quality of the performance. So uh, I'm performing better. Basically, the quality of my outcome was of a better quality. And this is what happens with generative yeah. AI. And what we found is that overall, there is a speed up, right? With, with these tools, people are faster and can do more. But the quality question is also important. How good is the work that's being done? And to, to go back to your question about the jagged frontier, here's the thing, right? There are no user manuals for these generative AI tools. If you remember, when we would get software, there'll always be a user manual. I remember getting the browser and there's a user manual on how to use the browser way back when, right? There's no user manuals for these tools because even the creators of these tools have been surprised by the capabilities demonstrated by these tools overall. And so for, for a consultant, Imagine a consultant that does a stream of activities for the same level of difficulty. In some cases, the generative AI tool is great. It, it performs really well. In other cases, it performs uh, poorly. And so that's what we mean. Like, like it's the jagged frontier is that for the same difficulty level, some things are, are, are just easy and some things are actually wrong. You shouldn't be doing them with, with the AI either. And that's what we discovered in our pre-work with the BCG consultants. And that's how we sort of designed the study as well. And, and what I would add as you're talking about this uh, software, uh, let's say, uh, manual, is the fact that this frontier is shifting over time. Yes. So you cannot say, oh, forever, this is within the frontier this is a good way where you sh a good task where you should use ChatGPT or generative AI and for that one you should not no because over time you will see that this is shifting and therefore you always need to experiment and to uh, revisit your belief yeah 100 percent so is this jagged frontier, which is in a sense the shifting boundary between being effective, with chat GPT producing quality results, is this due to the nature of chat GPT, the type of tasks or activities that were being requested, or did it have to do with the specific individuals? No, this is a feature of the technology, right? Because again, as a randomized controlled trial, what we can now say is that basically, right, when you give people a task that's outside the frontier and they're using the AI, uh, then most likely their performance is going to drop compared to those humans of equivalent skill, equivalent background, equivalent job history, approximately, right, who don't have the AI. And so that's, that's what the, this is a feature of the, of the technology itself. Can you give us some examples of when this technology is effective and when not? Because for so many of us, we're using chat GPT, we're experimenting, and we're figuring all of this out, you know, on an ad hoc basis as we go. 
it is as of today or even yesterday. Yes. Uh, it was very good at writing, brainstorming, these type of things. But where it was not good at was more on, let's say, linking different sources of content. So, for instance, um, the, um, the, the summarizing um, interviews and at the same time relating this, the content of these interviews to some quantitative uh, PL data. spreadsheets and so on. So, it was not good at doing quantitative analysis. So, but, but again, as I'm saying, this is shifting over time. So I'm less, I don't think that uh, I want to give to people the feeling that we know which task will be the right ones. And this is why companies should build experiment, the, an, an experiment uh, muscle to make sure that before they deploy at scale for a given use case, uh, generative AI, they shouldn't be able to uh, experiment first to make sure that it is creating and not destroying value in the way this technology and their employees are interacting and collaborating. Yeah. And I think I, the way I was to think about this, Michael, uh, is building on Francois said, right? The frontier is going to keep expanding and keep changing. And by the way, different large language models will have different capabilities as well, right? So that's part of the complexity we now face today. And the, the challenge that we will face is that you can't take for face value what these systems can do. You have to actually learn about how they apply in your work setting, in your particular in, in domain, and make sure that the expected answers are the same as what you what you would approve of without the without these tools. And once you can figure that out, then you're off to the races. And that's why, you know, as 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 Francois was saying, like this is where the the companies need to be not just passive receivers of this technology from the from the providers, but in fact, active adopters and applying their critical thinking on this on this kind of technology. The other thing I would sort of say is that you know the lead author on this paper, Fabrizio Delacqua, Dr. Fabrizio Delacqua, postdoctoral fellow at at at, at our institute, um, his his research has basically shown that humans can fall asleep at the wheel with AI. Right? When the AI is too good, they just take it for granted and they, they, they fail to apply their critical thinking skills to what the AI is telling us. And that's what we observed as well in our study. Right, And so there's a little bit of human behavior that we need to also unpack and make sure that we sort of inoculate people against being, you know, fall, falling asleep at the wheel as well. And that's a very important message that I think we want to uh, yes. portray to the, the audience that's out there. Please subscribe to our newsletter and subscribe to the CXO Talk YouTube channel. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have incredible shows coming up. We have an interesting comment from Simone Joe Moore on LinkedIn. It's outside the scope, I think, of what you studied, but I'd be interested in your opinion because it's it's thought provoking. And she says, are you concerned that ChatGPT and similar will spiral into eating its their own data into oblivion as humans rely more on it rather than creating more human content. In other words, that the the chat GPT will then will rely on other AI generated content. Look, from my perspective, we're in brand new territory. It's a great question. I think about it quite a bit, which is how will the human AI augment, which is the future for us, go, is going to work together? And how do we sort of think about the role of all this content that gets generated? Because the marginal cost of creating the content is going to zero, mm. right? And the scale is infinite in many ways. You just got to add, throw compute at it. And so that means that we can create as much synthetic data, as much synthetic content mm. that we want. But is that going to be useful or is that going to be garbage? And I think the question is TBD. I don't think yeah. we know yet because I don't think we as humans and as knowledge workers have even absorbed how to ad adapt these tools yeah. and do the, the new stuff. But, but, but this is exactly, I fully agree with what you say. We are just scratching the surface. It's, remember, it's a new industrial revolution. So when you have, um, let's say, look at the time between electricity and the modern factory with Stellarism. So I... 
it's going faster, but we don't know. What we know is that there are plenty of things that we don't know, and this is why we need to experiment. This is why we need to have guardrails and responsible AI and, and other things. We need to look at it, but we need to embrace it because it will probably be a, a source of competitive advantage. The, the capability to adopt and to increase the rate of learning of the adoption of these technologies is very likely to be, in my opinion, the, um, the, the, source, the main source of competitive advantage for the decade to come. I fully agree. And not just a decade, for, for a while. <laughs> okay, but you know, a decade today <laughs> yeah. is as infinite. Yes, so, uh, uh, years, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We have another really interesting, thought-provoking question from Twitter, and this is from Arsalan Khan. He's a regular listener. He always asks uh, very interesting questions. He says, what about hallucinations in the sense that AI can result in humans hallucinating that they are experts in anything just because they can ask questions to a generative AI? The way I talk about this in my, my, my framing of this tool is actually first to go back to uh, the browser. If you remember the browser 30 years ago, <laughs> right? And the browser got invented. And what the browser did was there's 30 years of the internet beforehand, and then we consumerized it. And what the browser did is that it lowered the cost of information transmission, right? Anybody could have a web page. Even the Oxford coffee pot could have a web page, right? It lowered the cost of information transmission. What is generative AI doing? My claim, and it's a strong claim, I think we have some evidence for it, is that it's lowering the cost of cognition, it's lowering the cost of problem solving, it's lowering the cost of creativity. So the example I give is that I'm terrible at art, I'm a disaster at art, but through mid-journey, I can create beautiful pieces just by speaking it. And by speaking it, I can do a lot more things in art. And I don't have to acquire and spend five years in art school to generate all this great art, right? And so, so for me, this, 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 this drop in the cost of cognition is a really important thing. And so the hallucination problem is different from yeah. what he's saying. What he's saying is, will people be faking expertise? And I'm saying, I think, again, a really good question. Uh, what I imagine is that you can get access to the world's expertise through these approaches. And then the question becomes, where do you apply your own judgment on it? And do you have the basis to apply your judgment on it? And I think, again, this is where like the education system that we're in is facing a big upheaval because we don't know yet how to bring this into the classroom in a proper way and, 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 and then tell people how to use these tools in a yeah. systematic way. Yeah, but I, I think on the, on the first part of your, of your answer, I partially disagree with you. Sure. In a sense you're, that... You're wrong, but anyway. No, yeah. you know... <laughs> Let's see, yeah. let's see. The time will tell. Yes, yes, yes. So is uh, that, of course, you don't need to spend uh, five years at school to um, do something, but what, the, what will the quality be of it? What will the quality be? And, and this is a challenge because I think we are lacking, we don't see yet all the imagination. We are too much focused on what we can do without it. And as you were referring yes. to the Internet Times, remember, you have the class of 95. In 1999, the, uh, the, the website of the New York Times was the PDF of the printed yes. version. So I think it's too early. So no, 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 I agree. But, so but, so but, I think, I, and, and I am trying to see whether, for instance, on data science, yes. for data scientists, very often people say, oh, yes, but with Gen AI, we don't need data scientists anymore. We might need them in a different way. Yes. There will be new, but I still believe, and I don't have evidence, so it's more, uh, let's say, an intuition, that there are things that today, without it, we, that cannot be solved by data scientists, but augmented data scientists might solve them. I agree, but also, again... Th so that's you see, a, you that's see a, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me put this in, in a frame, right? So the way to think about this here in this setting is to say that... A business person needs a data scientist, and a data scientist needs a business person, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, there's a, there's a partnership. The question is, how much of the work that the data scientist yeah. does 
can be augmented with a smart business person to drive the, the analysis. And then what does the data scientist do then, right? And then similarly, but that's my the, the cost of cognition dropping. Yeah. At the same time, how much of the work that the business person provides to the data scientist, the data scientist could do by themselves as well. And so that's the, that's the interesting space we're going to find ourselves in. And the question really is going to be about how do we think about judgment? Like, how do I know that this answer is the right answer? Just because it's written well, that that's, that's, that's not yeah. the right thing, right? The quality of writing is, is high. So how do I know it's the right answer? And I think that's, the, that's going to be where uh, yeah. the, the, all the, but the values are going to be created yeah. and the values are going to be destroyed. Yeah, but, and, and this is where I would say at the individual level, critical thinking becomes more important than ever. But, you know, it's a little bit like, we should not forget that um, generative AI is a little bit like your your right brain about creativity and so on. So that's great, but it's it's not reliable. It's if you want, uh, <laughs> it is as if you were talking uh, to a friend uh, who has read everything, remembers everything, but we all know that memory is not reliable. So don't take it for granted. That's for sure. But at the same time, what we uh, what we can say that we have these hallucinations. Are they bad? At the end. Oh, yeah. not, I don't think so. I think it's a feature, not a bug. It's yeah. a feature. Yeah. And and basically, it can create new ideas, new relationships. So it's a feature, yeah. not a bug. Given your research, what advice do you have for folks in organizations, for knowledge workers, as far as using, in a, in a practical way, using chat GPT and similar tools to for maximum benefit and effectiveness? For the individual, I believe you need to embrace it. You need to embrace it. You need to recognize as well that you uh, you will need to, because as we all know, the humans are not replaced by AI being uh, analytical or generative, but by humans using AI. So this is one thing. You need to augment it. But you need to remain flexible as well, because you will need, over time, your job will change. You will be able to have been reskilled, upskilled, trained, whatever, and make sure that you're not becoming lazy. I, I think we're back to that. I think that the for, for companies, it's a little bit different, um, but especially coming back to the previous question, you need, when you revisit your workflows, you need to make sure that there is enough time for quality control. If you are not having this critical thinking at the individual level and the quality control at a company level, you will be really in deep trouble. Yeah. Michael, if I may add a complimentary view on this as well. So for the individuals, um, you know, I wrote a, a sub stack on this uh, a few months ago. You know, I was taken by uh, a colleague of mine at Flagship Pioneering. He said, you know, Jobs had called uh, uh, the computer, the bicycle for the mind. And what the bicycle did was really uh, enable humans to go faster and further uh, than, just, than just by simply walking. And uh, generative AI in many ways is a bicycle for the mind. Now here's the thing though, most of us learn how to ride bikes when we're kids, right? And we can, uh, we can in a few weeks learn how to ride the bike and get going. Riding a bike as an adult is actually kind of difficult. Right, because A, it's embarrassing that you don't know how to ride a bike, you're gonna fall down, you're gonna get a concussion, you're gonna get a scraped knee, scraped elbows, bloody everything, right? And so what we're finding is to use this bicycle for the mind for individuals, you've gotta invest in the learning. You've gotta be able to push yourself and keep learning these tools. And these tools keep evolving, so the learning mandate is pretty high. And as Francois said, you also wanna be, uh, keep applying your critical thinking to this. So I think that's the first, the, on the individual level, the learning mandate is massive. I spend so much time on YouTube videos, <laughs> even now, to just be up to speed on what's going on in this space. For organizations, I agree with Francois, again, uh, that this is a critically important, and it's gonna be a source of competitive advantage. But my view is that the workflow will change. The processes will need to change. If we believe the numbers, and I do, that software developers have a 40% boost in productivity, right? 
or we can create as many uh, images as we want on Dolly or on Midjourney, then the marketing function will need to change. How we do marketing will need to change. How we do software development will need to change. So the process analysis needed to redo your organization will be very critical. And that, that I think many companies aren't thinking about yet. Mm -hmm. And then I would add in the layer that you need to add a, a, a perspective on, oh, like, for this particular task, do we believe the outputs of generative AI or not? We have another really interesting question from Hue Wang on LinkedIn. And uh, get ready for this one. She wants to know what to consider when assigning meaningful values around uh, when you're, it's, it's a long question, so I'm trying to interpret this. Uh, when evaluating the diversity of ideas, how do you bring in the subject's cultural or environmental background when considering bias, which is really the key here? And then she goes on with the assumption that a decision can be influenced through the, the human perspective based on their experiences and how it can be translated or transliterated, can we measure the potential bias, which may impact the end result? So I think what she's asking is, how do you measure bias, given the number of variables in a person's background and their experience? Complex question. What do we find in our research? Because we have this unique capacity to see the same task being done by hundreds of consultants, and then we can look at the ideas that from they all over the from all, all around the world, world. all around the world, all around the world, exactly, right. And what we observed is that while ChatGPT makes you smarter individually, collectively, those that use ChatGPT, their ideas sound similar. Right, And we can actually measure that semantic diversity in those ideas technically. We have natural language processing tools to be able to measure uh, uh, the, the semantic diversity. So this becomes a concern to us in the first place, right? So the way I talk about it is that, you know, if, if two consumer products companies are going to be using, mm -hmm. you know, Microsoft Azure, which they probably will, generative AI services, and they're both launching a new, uh, new, um, new SOAP uh, campaign geared towards academics, so SOAP for academics, and they both use ChatGPT, those will then create jet similar ideas for them. And so one of the things we're actually working on heavily right now is to do two things. Unpack the source of this homo homogenization in the ideas. And secondly, rerun all those prompts through other larger language models as well. So we're running it through Claude, we're running it through Llama, running it through Gemini to see if, in fact, do, does going to these okay. other models give us similar, do they have the same problems or not? So we're going we're gonna to be able to come back to you all with, uh, with some findings in the next few months. But here's a really important thing, which is ChatGPT and all these large language models have been trained off the internet, right? If you don't, if your culture, your, uh, your point of view is not publicly available for training, then that will be represented. So that's the worry that I, I hear mm. her saying, is that because the training data is so critical, and that's why you know the French with Mistral and Macron have said, we need to make sure that French cultural uh, yeah, act acti activities are represented, right? And Mistral is, is driving that, and the French government is driving that, but then others can also absorb it. And so this becomes a, a key yeah. concern, national cultural concern, that these tools are very good. We could get trapped in Hollywood type homogenization of our cultural artifacts yes. if we don't make sure that they are available for training. May I come back just for one second to your Jenny I bike bicycle um, yeah. analogy because very often. Do you like it or not? I love it. Okay. Uh, it's, 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 by, again, full credit, Armin McCrachin at Flagship Pioneering reminded me of that and we've been talking about, uh, about but, but about. i think it is a good not just because it helps you do better what you were doing on that but because it frees up time as well and therefore it allows you to move and develop other things because if i come back to to uh, to our uh, experiment the thing that really surprised me most was how much our consultants 
were embracing this technology, they were, not, they were feeling that they were augmented, not threatened, and they were telling us, but you know, it's a great opportunity because there are many things I won't do anymore. I will then be able to focus and become a much deeper expert, for instance, in change management, um, as you mentioned, because we can see that as it is the rate of learning of these and to adopt these technologies is becoming a source of competitive advantage. Therefore, there will be change management will become more important. So it's an opportunity for consultants and so on. So you were talking about uh, consulting is dead, long live consulting. <laughs> but 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 you I said it. I didn't. I, 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 you, you said consulting is dead. Uh, I, I didn't say public. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is so. But but I think that's very important, and it is true for every every company. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. But can I say one thing though? So I mean, I, I I think there's heterogeneous response to this technology with knowledge workers. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, we had when we had, and this will go under the hood a bit, right? And so, uh, and I want to really acknowledge our our full research team that has been working on this, right? So we basically had uh, Saran and Lisa from BCG working with us. Uh, then on our side, uh, you know, we had uh, you know Dr. Fabrizio Delacqua, uh, Professor Edward McFowland uh, from HBS, uh, Professor Kate Kellogg from Sloan at MIT, and Professor Hila Lushitz from uh, from Warwick University. Then Ethan. Uh, and also, of course, our good friend, uh, Professor Ethan Mollick uh, uh, from Wharton as well. So this made, made up the team. And we did this all collectively. Here's the thing that that really, uh, when we first designed the study, it was going to be a purely a quantitative exercise, right? We were just basically trying to understand these effects, had all these numbers and all these measures, and that's what we're going to do. In some pre-work and pre-testing the study, we had consultants go do the work with without ChatGPT and then with ChatGPT, and then uh, we did some interviews. Our our team did some interviews, and so Fabrizio reported back to me this one incident, which really like blew my mind. And I said, "Oh shoot!" I said other French words, but I said, "Oh shoot! Uh, we better be careful about this." So this consultant did the task. It, it took them two hours. Then this consultant did the task with ChatGPT. It took them twenty minutes. Right, and the reaction was. The reaction was, this feels like junk food, mm -hmm. empty calories. And I was stunned, Michael. I was stunned. And I called up <laughs> Francois. I said, what the hell? Like, here I'm like techno-optimist. This is the best thing ever. It's going to be incredible. And now these people, these very smart people are saying, empty calories? What's going on? So that triggered us to actually bring Gila and Kate into our research group because they were experts at doing qualitative interviews and really understanding the dynamics of what's going on. And then we added a whole layer of interviews where more than 500 consultants got interviewed by our team, by led by, by Kate and by Gila to, to really understand what's going on. And that's where we're gonna have yeah. even more. I mean, this study is just the start of like a range of additional papers that'll come yeah. out. And this notion that the, there is a heterogeneous view about some people are just like, Shoot, my job's at risk. Shoot, I spent all this time being top, right? I, I went to the top uh, in high school. I worked my butt off. I got in the top undergrads. I had good jobs in undergrads. I'm in the top business schools, right? Now I'm working at the top consulting yeah. company in the world, right? It takes me two hours to do this thing and 20 minutes? Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah, but, but but this is where there is a question about what can you do with this time yes. that is free. And, yes. and, 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 but, but it's true. What, it, what is true with that? When I say I was really Really amazed by the fact the way they embraced it is partially maybe not true for every job. Yes. So, but for these, I would say high skill workers, yes. knowledge workers, then they see it as an opportunity to refocus on something maybe more important. Yes. Yes. Greg Walters on LinkedIn says, "When will AI move beyond requiring historical data?" He says, when will AI become so predictive it will not need static past data? The models being so optimized that they have run out, that they've outrun the need for quote unquote old data. I don't know. Yeah, same here. I don't know. Point one. Point two, but you know, even us humans, we are working and dealing with old data. Basically, when we make connections, and, and I would like to make the difference between Generative AI, your right brain, and 
analytical AI, your left brain. So it's these are different things. At some point, there might be convergence or. Uh, and then you will have a right and a left brain, yes. for whatever it means. But I, I think that it's very, um, we make connections. So I think the transformers, and this is why I like basically hallucinations yes. as a feature, because even when we want to be creative, we are very often connecting things that were not connected before. And this is what the transformer architecture does. So, um, so, so I don't think that relying on past data prevents you from being creative. Of course, you might not be able to create, uh, let's say, uh, quantum mechanics, but we don't, even as humans, we don't often create quantum mechanics. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I think that for the traditional level of creativity, a lot can be done leveraging this past data. So we don't have, uh, Gen AI doesn't have to get rid of it to really reach out to the next level. Yeah. I'm going to jump the line to Wes Andrews on Twitter, who asks a question, will generative AI only make it harder to consider outlier outcomes? I would say no, because one of the things in my own usage of generative AI is to throw it scenarios that seem improbable and get it to explain things or do things. And so I would say that the... Here's the thing that I've, you know, I've sort of uh, encountered in my use of it, and I use it a lot, um, that, you know, unlike my human RAs, you know, they don't get tired, uh, the Gen AI doesn't get tired, it doesn't complain to me that I'm asking too many questions, that I changed my mind, and I can keep, keep going back and back and back and back. Uh, and so the ability for you to re... I don't think reasoning is even the right thing to say. Mm. The ability for you to think with it for now and and get 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 yourself to to imagine improper scenario uh, improper scenarios and have it game it out with you uh, is quite quite interesting. Uh, and again, this is where like how do we develop skills in using this tool which never gets tired which can draw connections and ways and find patterns in ways that are not, uh, that, are, that most humans can't do. So the question then becomes, how am I gonna ask the question to imagine scenarios that are not possible? And will I actually even pay attention to it when those come up? So in fact, I think the, the scenario, the creative hallucinatory generating perspective is infinite in many ways, then it's a human limitation to be able to absorb and say, you know, what's the likelihood of these things happening? Yes, and I agree with you that this is a human factor that is a limiting factor. Because you can even imagine, because at the moment, it's still quite expensive yes. to use. But with the uh, compute well, 20, power... 20 bucks a month? You know, for a company, it's expensive. If you do it for all your employees. 20 bucks a month? Yeah, for all your employees. Yes, because I will come back to that. Um, and then if you, uh, because, but with the compute power that will explode, continue to explode over yeah. the few next few years, probably the cost will drop yes. dramatically. So it won't be uh, 20 bucks. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's very important because then you could run as many scenarios. You could uh, be in a war game play yes. all the time and and therefore you could be then the the our ability to absorb and to decide yeah. will be the limiting factor and it is true for the individual in that case it is true for a company um, yes. at all yeah tell us how centaurs and cyborgs fit into your generative ai research what we found, because as you said, we were able to look at the way people were prompting and working, we found that there were two different categories. You had the what we call the centaurs, because they are dividing the work with AI, and cyborgs, who are people, consultants, that are co-working with AI. So what does it mean? It means that for the, um, the centaurs, basically, they were using AI for some set tasks, mostly writing, brainstorming, and the cyborgs were using it for everything, including on top of these two, framing, qualitative analysis, quantitative analysis, recommendations, and so on. And at the moment, and I say at the moment, given the current jagged frontier, the centaurs had better results because they were using Gen AI 
with subtasks from within the frontier. So they were not making the same mistakes as the cyborgs. But what will happen over time, we don't know. And, and what it says is that for a company, you absolutely need to understand how people will act and collaborate with, um, with AI because you will have different types of collaborations. Yeah. So uh, if I may summarize. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I just want to add one more thing, which is I remember the moment when we discovered those two categories and the names actually came from our good colleague, Ethan, Ethan Mollick. So he's the one who said, oh, this looks like a centaur type behavior. This looks like a cyborg type behavior. And both Ethan and I are big, uh, you know, science fiction and mythology yeah. fans. And so we yeah, were very and, happy and, to And because, it, because to know exactly <laughs> how a centaur behaves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's you really. Need to know a little bit of uh, fiction. <laughs> Again, this was a great collaboration. I remember I was in my car on a conference call with the team. All of us were going, trying to make sense of it. It was a hot summer day. Uh, and uh, that's when we sort of honed in on the, on the typology and the categories. Would it therefore be accurate to say that the cyborgs were more willing to take risks and experiment and no, more, no, 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 not at all. I would say almost the other way around because basically cyber centros were delegating some tasks, sub tasks to AI almost. So, so, but I, I think it's more the way you behave and what we will see, we'll see different types of augmented humans. Yeah. And, and in fact, and it could also depend on the tasks. Right, mm -hmm. so it could also be task dependent. On some some tasks, you may act like a cyborg. In other tasks, you may act like a centaur. So it may not just be typologies mm -hmm. of people; it may be task dependent as well. But but as said, we are just at the beginning. Yes, hundred percent. What's incredible about this study, and again, this is like the true partnership, is that we could build these systems that we could keep track of every single prompt, keep track of every single reply that the consultants were doing, and then, then we could go back and sort of reconstruct these, these types of behaviors. So that was, again, this incredible partnership that we had with BCG and our academic team. So on X, formerly known as Twitter, I feel like we're talking about Prince here, and Dominic Ravita says, based on this study, what new questions and possibilities do you see for how software development is done, could this technology help mitigate the impact of the growing software engineer shortage? Yes, for two reasons. The first one, because we see that there is a, here a productivity opportunity because instead of taking two hours, it takes 10, 20 minutes in software development. And Andre Carpati said that he is not developing coding anymore, he is prompting and uh, testing. So, so I think that's the first mm. part. The second part is because of what we were talking about earlier on and the ability to uh, for the augmented human to really uh, deal with tasks it was not prepared for originally, it can drastically increase the, uh, the, the, the talent pool because it's not a, a, a series of tasks will be performed by people who do not have this software engineering uh, diploma. Yeah, there was a team out of China that as a demonstration project showed how you could basically build all these agents to basically go in and be the customer's voice, be the product manager, yeah. be the developer, be the tester, be the the deployment person, and and be the and, and all that, right? And they 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 showed that you could what would take you two weeks to get done uh, uh, with lots of humans, you could get done in ten minutes with generative AI. So that was just a proof. I mean, there are lots of details that need to be figured out. But I would agree yeah. that I think um, you know. Uh, the demand for software development is infinite. It truly is. And there aren't enough software developers in the world. And so just as the consultant's job is going to change, mm -hmm. the software developer's job is also going to change dramatically. And, and the software development process is going to change dramatically. And, and as you may, were mentioning agents, any it will change permanently. We are, and I love to quote Leon Trotsky, the, uh, to say that we are entering a permanent revolution era. Today yeah. we have LLMs, and now yesterday we had LLMs, now we have multi LMMs yeah, so. with multimodals. Tomorrow we will have autonomous agents. So I, I think that we need to understand that it will dramatically change over time. 
So uh, even in a short period of time, I was discussing with Jean Lecun, uh, let's say a few months back, where he was telling me, okay, autonomous agents, okay, there are still things to be done. It's not just by growing computer, uh, compute power or the number of parameters, but it is likely to happen before the end of the decade. Yes. Arslan Khan comes back on Twitter X and he has an economic question. He says, typically in organizations, humans are either, this is a great question. He says, humans are either full-time or part-time. What financial value do you assign to an AI that replaces humans or even augments humans? Is AI a full-time equivalent? How do you budget for AI? More and more AI will become a kind of colleague because of course every individual will get augmented individually, but it's true that when you work as one team, and this is something we would need to work on because it's very difficult to, to measure. But you can imagine that you would have uh, AI as a facilitator, a moderator, an expert, whatever. So, so I, I think that, um, and, and I think it was last year, Google spent more on computational power than on HR. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I, I got it, and maybe from Azim. So yes. Azim yeah. Azar. So by the way, Azim was really a, a fantastic person. I think that we need to realize that yes, you will have to deal with that. But again, I don't think. I I think that for companies, the way to bring give a, a valuation is really to think about Gen AI, how you can solve real business questions. Very often when I'm talking to companies, they say, oh, what can I do with Gen AI? That's not the right way to think about it. If you want to be able to bring a valuation, you need to say, okay, how can I solve a business question leveraging the power of Gen AI? And it can be uh, um, by reducing the cost of a given function and reshaping it, as you said, with the processes, customer service, marketing, whatever. Uh, or it is by creating new, um, uh, new products and as a bit of an advertisement, you should look at L'Oreal's uh, Genius, which is their new uh, virtual uh, beauty uh, beauty advisor that was uh, presented this week at the CES in Las Vegas. Uh, so, so I think these are things that are really important. Solve real business questions if you want to have real impact, and therefore you will then be able to bring value to put a value on it. Otherwise, you will have an impact but it will be diffuse productivity and therefore it will be a negative impact on your PNL. We have a question, another really interesting one from Greg Walters on LinkedIn, who, and this is, this is related to the outlier question earlier. He says, can Gen AI be trained to take chances to make and provide quote unquote risk, risky decisions and answers? I think we were going to, you know, our colleague Edward McFarland uh, has been thinking about this from a very statistical perspective. So, does the so if you think about what's going on, and I'm going to like butcher this perspective, Edward will provide a much better explanation. So it's trained off the internet, right? And then it has to give you a statistical answer, right? The way LMs work is a statistical probability. What's the next word? That's what it is doing, right? That's all it's doing. And so then if it's a statistical based system that is going to give you the average answer, right? The average answer. And the, the open question is, can you get it to give you the two sigma, the three sigma, the six sigma answer as well? I believe the answer is yes, but I haven't seen any sort of significant studies where we have for the same type of things prompted the AI to give us outliers. Uh, so I, there's no technical reason why you can't sample from the distribution that's further away from the mean, further down. Uh, uh, but but we'll see if, if if in practice we can actually pull that off or not. Did this research change how you or your teams or you personally use these tools like ChatGPT? I've become a cyborg, <laughs> so I, I'm very much uh, you know I have a. Um, uh, um, in my massive monitor, 
Uh, I have one window always open with three tools. I use ChatGPT, I use Perplexity, and I have uh, Poe uh, up and running. Uh, and so I'm using it as a, a companion all the time, and also even in my smartphone, right? So I've got Poe and ChatGPT, and so I'm c continuously using it all the time. Uh, and my usage has increased uh, since uh, since we started the study. And on our side, I would say at the team level, uh, it has, we are deploying it as much as we can just because we want to better understand the second and third and fourth order effect yes. uh, on one hand. And because, and it was part of our uh, discussions as well, because I think that these AI transformations, more than any other transformations, are critical and impacting our professional identity. Um, and, and, and this is something that is important um, and that we need to deal with because uh, it will be critical in the change management for uh, in companies. And the other thing that we did that uh, this study uh, impacted in my team is that we really reinforced the research on the change management. Yes. If I can add one more thing. Uh, the th I've been out talking a lot about this. What I've been surprised by, contrary to you know, Francois' assessment of how the BCG consultants looked at that, is that a lot of people are worried. Many people are worried about job loss and, and, and sort of de-skilling and so forth. And that, that is, has made me aware, like, like, we can't take for granted that acceptance of these solutions are going to be easy. That's why the change management story is so important. Mm. And, and it's really personal change management, identity. Yeah. Like, what are your, are your skills now, given that these tools are so powerful? Because you can say that uh, in a company uh, with analytical AI, uh, contributors don't need managers because AI will tell them what to do. Yes. And managers with generative AI don't need contributors yes. because basically they will have all the things that are done yeah. for creativity. So, so I think that it's, we need to invent what will happen, but it yeah. is a new world. It's yeah. an industrial revolution, and even yes. I was discussing with uh, Professor Sinan Aral yes. uh, from MIT, who was saying, no, no, it's not an industrial revolution, it is a revolution. We had agriculture, industry, and now this is a third. Yes. I don't know if he's right, but uh, for sure it's big. Sinan is a pretty smart guy. Yeah, yeah. he is. <laughs> On LinkedIn, Benjamin Hoon asks a very serious uh, question, comment, uh, but we don't have much time to answer it. He says, generative AI is basically a tool that supports repeated tasks with a known existing data set. No, with that's, that's incorrect. Okay, he goes on to say, based on that assumption, which we already know you do not agree with, he that is wrong, he says, any prediction that AI generates, therefore, on this limited data set is therefore high risk of errors, not bias. I know I can tell you where this is wrong, but anyway, uh, bias is something you know right and wrong and consciously take risks contradicting the existing fact that then become ethnic issues, so I think there's a language thing. So obviously he's not considering the fact of a bias built into the data, but Karim, go ahead. I just don't think it's the right portrayal of the tool and what it does. I, and I would encourage him to actually use the tool in his workflow, personal as well as a professional, to see what it can do. What is true is that, and we touched it, given 70% of the internet is written in English, there is a real risk in terms of biases and in terms of soft power. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's, that is, it's a national issue. That's why it's a national that's issue. Why France, yeah, yeah, Macron, I agree, I agree. Dubai, no, 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 UAE, no. you know, India, everybody's freaking out, saying we better make sure that we can build our own homegrown systems. And you should. In, in fact, I have to tell you this. I'm, you know, at HBS, we have the same issue, right? We write all these cases. We have all we have a publishing arm that that copyrights everything. Right, and the question for us is: Should we let these models train off our of our of our information uh, and of our knowledge? And I say I'm a big. There's no agreement on this school about this. Our policy is we don't upload stuff into our our documents up into these systems. Is my view is that no, of course, because my research is going to get lost in these generative AI tools if they if they if it hasn't trained off my my work. Yeah. So personally, I'm yeah. like I'm like worried sick that we're going to make the wrong choices about yes, this. Yes, clearly, yeah. I'm on your side. Yeah.
Also, the, the, it's not the technology that is making a biased decision. It's bias that is inherent, built into the underlying data. Can I ask each one of you in turn to share your thoughts or advice for business leaders on the use uh, and the adoption of these technologies in their organizations? Um, Francois, you want to go first, maybe? Today, many people are a little bit worried about, should I do it? Should I wait for the next generation? You need to start now. As I said, as I said earlier on, the main source of competitive advantage moving forward will be your ability to adopt this and unleash the power of these technologies. The clock speed of these technologies is much faster than the clock speed of the organization to adopt them. So if you are able to adopt them a bit faster, then you will have a great competitive advantage. So go for it, don't wait. Totally agree. I felt that the, a year ago, as these tools became generally available, many companies were misguided in banning these tools. And it's sort of saying, you know, like, this is all terrible and bad. I don't know what the, I don't know if anybody's in the study to see if people have updated their policies or not. They are updated. But, um, have, they, have they stopped the bans? No, they've stopped, especially because of shadow AI. Yes. Uh, basically, they were, it was banned, but people were using yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, so, exactly. Uh, and so, so my view is that for leaders, especially, it's a big learning mandate. Yeah. You have to know how these systems work and use them yourself in order to be able to help your organization. You can't delegate this to a junior person or to somebody else in your team. I really think, and I tell this to boards, I tell this to the C-suite, I say, you have to invest in the learning yourself. This is a bicycle for the mind. You have to learn to ride the bike, right? You can't just vicariously watch a movie about it and say, I understand it. You don't understand balance until you actually ride, learn to ride a bike. Same thing here as well. Okay. And with that, a huge thank you to our guest, Karim Lakhani from the Harvard Business School and Francois Condelon from Boston Consulting Group. Thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. It was. And to everybody in the audience, thank you for watching. You guys are amazing. Before you go, please subscribe to our newsletter and subscribe to the CXO Talk YouTube channel. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have incredible shows coming up and everybody will see you again next time. Have a great day.